Hi, I'm Michael Morris, Superintendent of the Amherst Public Schools, and welcome to the latest edition of Window into ARPS. I'm so pleased today to be joined by two members of our English Language Learner Department. And what's particularly notable about today's episode is this topic came from parent request. A uh, parent guardian in our district uh, watches many of the Window into ARPS episodes and said, hey, you haven't, seen, ta you haven't talked much about um, English language learner teachers, and my son's an English language learner and has benefited so much from that department that I think you should run an episode on it. And here we are. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, and I think for much in the community, uh, for many people in the community, they know that we have English language learners in the district, and they don't necessarily have all the insight into what our programs and services and how we support that community. So I'm so glad that you're both chosen to join us today. Um, so why don't you each tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you work, and what, how you came to become an ELL teacher in the district in Amherst. Okay. Would you like to start, uh, Sue? I'll start. Um, I work at the high school. Um, I've been there for quite a while. Um, I, um, when I moved, I, I went to UMass, actually, but then I, I went overseas and did a master's degree in Cairo. Um, I'd always been interested in learning languages, and uh, my master's was in teaching English as a foreign language. And then when I came back to the States, I um, uh, moved back to Massachusetts and heard that Amherst was a strong district and applied for a job and knew that there was a strong ELL program even back then, which was 1989, mm -hmm. and uh, got hired. So. That's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know we'll, we'll, we'll dig in a little deeper in the, later in the, yeah. in the conversation. Terry? Okay. Um, well, I was born in Minnesota yeah. and went to college there. After college, I spent about a year and a half in Chicago studying urban education and volunteering in a preschool with um, Latin American kids from Latin America. Um, went back to Minnesota and taught in a Spanish immersion program. So I did the opposite of what I'm doing now. I taught um, <laughs> Spanish to mostly English speakers. Um, then we moved out east um, in 2008. I worked in New York um, and then transitioned into ESL. That's uh, the job that was open for me. So I, um, I had my coursework in ESL, so I became licensed and taught ESL in, in New York. And then we moved here in 2010. Um, I taught first at Fort River, and then I've been at Crocker Farm um, since 2010. Fantastic. And uh, both of you touched on this a bit, but what motivated you to decide to work with this particular um, specific population of students? Um, the nomenclature keeps on changing, but uh, the current nomenclature that um, we're using is English learners. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's worth noting that you know, it used to be ESL, English as a second language, and for so many of our students, English is not their second language. They have multiple languages they're coming, uh, and which is a huge strength to our district with. But uh, what was it that made that something that you were interested in, in studying and then eventually uh, having as your vocation, or your profession? Either of you can start. Try. Um. I'll go. Go. Um, so I've always been interested in languages and language acquisition, and I was a Spanish major as an undergraduate. Um, so I love using languages and the idea of how to help somebody learn another language um, has always intrigued me. And knowing Spanish has also been a great asset in working with families um, in schools. So um, that's a big draw. And I think also um, it's quite rewarding that children learning languages, they learn it by leaps and bounds. Yeah. So um, it's one of the most wonderful things in my job, I think, is especially working with kids. I'm working with kids now who I've worked with since kindergarten. Mm. So to see the growth from a kindergartner to a fifth grader, or even to see a beginner's growth from the beginning of the year to the end is, is one of the best things I like about my job. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's very similar for me. Um, I was always interested in language um, and culture. I was a French major as an undergrad, mm. but I also studied Spanish and Arabic in college, and then as I said, I, I lived in Cairo. And um, I'm also of Lebanese ancestry, so I grew up around a different culture and language and food and music. And um, so going to really wanting to m live in Egypt and then getting into this program is what started me down this path. And um, uh, it's, it's been incredible just getting to know the students and 
um, their families and learning. I've learned so much um, over the years. And one other thing that um, I remember now, and I didn't realize it then, was that when I was in high school, I tutored students from Columbia. Hmm. And I, I helped them with English back then. And I had no idea then that I was going down this path. So. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the interesting things that I get uh, often from visitors to our district is uh, they assume that our English learner population uh, come with one language or two languages. And you know, it would be, I think, helpful for the community to hear a little bit of what languages you see uh, mm -hmm. in your, the students that you're working with. Yeah. Um, currently, we see a lot of Spanish speakers. We have a lot of Cape Verdeans who um, come with two languages already, usually Creole and Portuguese. We have Chinese speakers, Arabic speakers, um, French. We have students from Africa that speak a number of different languages. And it varies from year to year. We never know. When I first started, we had a lot of Cambodian and Vietnamese students. And um, you just never know. Absolutely. And at Crocker Farm, about 20% of our students are English language learners or get support from the ELL program. Um, Spanish speaking is our, the biggest number. Um, we have lots of families from El Salvador and then some from Puerto Rico, Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador. Um, then we also have a sizable group from China um, the, the, whose parents are studying at UMass. Usually they're just here for a year or two. Um, then we have other students whose parents are also at UMass but might be in a longer program. Um, we have several Arabic speakers, Tamil, um, Tibetan, Farsi, um, Portuguese, um, Cape Verde Creole, uh, let's see, French, Nepali. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that just hearing you both talk about the level, the, the wide array of languages is how do you approach, um, I mean I, no one can know all the languages that your students speak, or I think it'd be hard pressed to find someone who can do that. So how, how are you able to integrate all those different languages um, into the, the school setting where, at least at this point, the primary language is English? Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that wide array, because I think it's really different than uh, certain districts that I've visited where there's a large ELL population or English language learner population, but everyone speaks, th that population itself is, is pretty monolingual, whether it's Spanish or Korean or mm -hmm. Chinese. And that's not the case in Amherst. I don't know if you've ever given some thought to how to integrate all those different languages, um, language backgrounds, I should say, into your classes. Well, we, um, I mean, actually, the wider the array, yeah. the better yeah. <laughs> for teaching English, yeah. because the students are forced to communicate with each other. Um, I mean, it's helpful to know the students' languages, but we don't have to know their languages to teach English. Yeah. So we, at the high school, we have a, a very well-established curriculum that um, you know, we use. We test the students when they first get here, and we place them in classes uh, based on their level of English, from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And, um, our classes are English language classes, but they're also content classes. Um, we're teaching them what they'll need to, to be successful once they get into regular English. And social studies classes. We, we also teach social studies at, in my department. So, um, you know, we have, we're with the students for, you know, two or three years, sometimes more. So we really develop a community and um, we get to know a lot about each other um, through presentations the students do, through journal writing, and many different things. So it's, yeah. it's, it's great. Yeah. The diversity is, is a real plus. Yeah, I've seen that in one of my favorite things I get to do in the spring is go to the ELL, um, the picnic that the high school for that yeah. puts on. And it's amazing to see the, the number of languages, English being one of them, that's spoken routinely because of the diversity of languages. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the most important thing that I get to see is the community that's built by yourself and the other um, staff members who, um, you know, when the seniors are leaving, there's genuine sadness, uh, not just in the staff, but, but also for the younger students who that's part of their community that's graduating and it's, it's bittersweet or obviously happy that students are graduating, but um, that doesn't come naturally. So I really want to thank you and the staff at the high school for, for, for working on that. Um, so 
kind of connected, how do you approach, either of you approach the task of helping students acquire English while they're still learning the content of the courses? I mean, you mentioned some, and I know you work in, in similar areas. So, you know, they're learning English and at the same time, there's content that's not about language that's being integrated as well. And so how do you approach that task? Sue mentioned that she teaches social studies yeah. and part of um, my work um, in previous years and a little bit this year is also working with social studies in sixth grade. So right now they're studying early humans. And um, so there is the content about cave dwellers uh, and their characteristics and their capabilities. But we're also able to integrate language using the language of compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. So um, students are learning how to use phrases like the, the um, Lucy, the, the biped, was similar to humans in that she, or another frame, um, she was different because. So we're teaching language structures at the same time as introducing content. Or in third grade, my students are writing realistic fiction, but they're needing to use the past tense. So we'll be working on past tense irregulars, you know, ran and run or bring and brought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, we have um, content, you know, throughout our English classes. And even from the very beginners, we're teaching them, you know, how to write a paragraph, uh, topic sentence, concluding sentence. Um, you know, literature, character, you know, developing characters and um, explaining plot and things like that. Yeah. So it's all intertwined and the folk, but, but you know, we're, we are developing their English language. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, what are some of the challenges for the English learner population, you know, that you see in the district, whether it's, you know, during the school day or, or broader challenges that the community faces? Well, one thing um, <laughs> that um, my students face is a lot of testing. Um, kids in general in Massachusetts get tested a lot. They take MCAS starting at third grade, MCAS in ELA and in math. And um, our ELL students also have to take the access test in January. And then we've started a new um, progress monitoring that they also take. So um, I feel like I feel bad for them in that they have to sit through a lot of testing, um, but then they also miss out on some inst instructional time because they're taking a test or because I'm administering the test, then I can't be teaching them in the classroom. So one challenge I think they face is just a lot of tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, same thing at the high school. And at the high school, on top of that, the students face a lot of pressure because they're, they only have a limited amount of time some of them come with no English at all. They need to earn credits towards graduation. They need to pass the MCAS tests as a graduation requirement. And it's, it's hard. Um, and in addition, we are seeing many of our students, or some of our students, come with strong educational backgrounds in their first language. And that's really helpful because they can transfer the vocabulary and the, just the things that they know, of the academic skills that they have, they can transfer that to the new language. But uh, we are seeing more and more students who are coming with um, limited or interrupted education. And so they are not only needing to learn English, but they're needing to learn so much vocabulary and so many just academic skills. Yeah. And um, so it it's hard, it's really hard for them. Um, another thing with high school is college. So getting kids ready, you know, like most of them and most of their parents haven't really experienced the whole college process. So we actually did start last year a college, a, it's called Step by Step to College program, where we meet with students once a month during the school day to, um, you know, just help them through that process. Yeah. What it, whether they're going to community college or four-year college. Yeah. Um, so that's another challenge. Yeah. And Sue mentioned vocabulary. I think that's the, the biggest key that um, research has shown that kids learn social vocabulary in three to five years after coming. So most of our students, um, many of them speak without an accent. And to hear them, you might think, oh, they um, they're a native speaker and they're just fine, they're not ELL. Um, but it takes five to seven years to develop academic vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So um, a big challenge our students face is, is being able to function in the classroom because they're lacking some of the um, 
the specific words that they need in order to participate orally or to, to write an essay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things that I think a lot about is just the fatigue of being in a school day where it's not your home language that's being spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the opportunity to be in um, a place that where English is not the primary language with someone who could translate for me when I needed it, um, mm -hmm. but that gets tiring too, uh, even for students who are further along. Uh, we had this experience this year where we, uh, the administrative group practices doing observations what high quality teaching is and we watched a seven minute lesson that was in Spanish. It was in a dual language school um, somewhere far away. And uh, for most of our administrators, not all, but most of our administrators don't speak Spanish um, or understand Spanish very well. And the big piece of feedback was, I don't know how our English learners mm -hmm have any energy left at the end of the day. Because even this was a seven minute clip, low stress environment, right? This mm -hmm. wasn't a test. This was just a normal professional development exercise. And it was seven minutes long and, and people felt like they needed a break, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. afterwards. So we, we, we built a lot of empathy for understanding what it must be like for a student who has six, six hours of instruction or five hours of instruction mm -hmm. in a language that's not their, their primary language over the course of a day. Um, yeah. So I, I, we often mm -hmm. wondered about that. And on top of that, um, a lot of the high school students have to work. Yeah. And so we have students that go straight from school to work, and they work a lot of hours. Yeah. And um, they, uh, you know, they don't get to, many of them don't get to connect as well with after school clubs and sports and things like that because they have other responsibilities. Yeah. And so that, that can be difficult too. Yeah. And, and, you know, oftentimes the other thing, uh, before I, I go to the next question, that I know I've heard from ELL students in the past, and I know we, we've spoken about in different settings, is uh, for some of them they play the role, um, because they have more English than their families do, mm -hmm. they play a larger role at home in supporting families with, with lots of um, just life mm -hmm. events, and, li and the support they need to give is, is larger than in monolingual English-speaking homes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just Recently, last year, um, or in the last in the last year, the Look Act passed in Massachusetts, which was intended to reform a bit of the um, ELL programming across the state and offer more flexibility. And so, I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. It made you know the Boston Globe and our local papers, but on a functional level, um, from a, from your perspective, were there any implications that that you're seeing um, as the as it's still getting implemented? It's not done mm. yet. Uh, but since that law is passed, any thoughts you have about that? One thing um, I know Katie Richardson, the ELL director, is really um, bringing on board is the LPAC, yeah. which is a requirement under the Look Act. Um, it's a parent advisory council of English language learner parents. Um, and the meeting was first meeting was yesterday, yeah. and we had um, quite a good turnout in the evening meeting. And yeah. um, so that's exciting, I think. Parents. Um, getting excited about providing education to other ELL parents, maybe about American culture or about how to help your children succeed in school. Um, so that's something exciting that will come about because of the act. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing I think is the seal of biliteracy, mm -hmm. um, where students can prove that they're literate in, in two languages and then receive a special recognition for that. And um, that's something I think ELL teachers have really been stressing for a long time is that bilingualism is a gift and um, the, the additive aspect of learning a second language, it's a good thing. And so I think it's, a, it's a great that it's a recognition of that. Yeah. yeah, and one more thing that seems positive is, I, is the flexibility that school districts will now have to create the kinds of programs that work best in their districts. And I don't know if the new dual language program came out of the Look Act or... It's supportive, it, yeah. supported by the flexibility, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. 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 Well, oh, connected to what Sue said, I think being able to provide instruction um, in a student's native mm -hmm. language, especially when they have interrupted schooling. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had students come with who aren't literate in their own language and being able to instruct them for a short time in their own language in order for them to for example, learn the alphabet or understand what phonics means um, is, a, is a great gift. It is, and then research would indicate that's the best practice, and yet we had, in Massachusetts until this law for 15 years prior, we hadn't been able to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the interesting statistics in the dual language research that I did was that uh, well over half the world's child population is raised in mu multilingual environments. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very American concept in some ways mm -hmm. that, you know, 
language learning is a challenge. I mean, is is something that's not necessarily a benefit because um, most of the world grows up. It's just not as much in this particular country. But um, I, I like that statistic because it really reframes the to what you're saying is the the ling multilingualism is a strength, and we're supporting that in students and skill by literacy. Mm -hmm. I think formalizes that process in a state stamp kind of way, which I think is helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just briefly, in what ways do you instruct students, you know, inside the class, general ed classroom, outside the general ed classroom? What are the kind of different methodologies that you use when working with English learners? Well, we are a general ed program, and uh, we have our own discrete classrooms at the high school. And uh, we, you know, like I said, have our curriculum. So generally, they are um, being taught that way. Um, I, as, as the department head, I also do connect with teachers in other departments uh, about how the students are doing in their classes and try to figure out ways to support them if they need it. Thank you. Yeah. And at the elementary level, we have a little more flexibility. I do have my own classroom, um, and we have um, four ELL teachers on staff. So um, a couple of them work especially with beginners, and they pull beginners who um, are just arrived or who have been here for a year or two to their classrooms for small group work. Um, and during my day, for example, I start out the morning in fifth grade and I push in, which means I go and I work with alongside the teacher. We alternate teaching lessons to teach fifth grade writing. And then I come upstairs and work with sixth graders one-on-one -on -one in an individual reading tutorial or a vocabulary for a 20-minute um, vocabulary um, burst before they go into the regular classroom and then I go back down and teach third grade writing alongside a, a regular ed teacher and we again share the share the lessons um, and then I pull a small group out of fifth grade to do a, a small group reading um, and then in the afternoon I again push into a, a fourth grade unit study so we're teaching social studies and science but it's um, to a whole group but when I'm in the regular classroom, I'm supporting the classroom teacher with vocabulary, um, with a word wall, or um, with visual aids, or um, working one-on-one -on -one with students who need a little bit more support. Mm. Thank you so much. I just love to give a shout out to the bilingual interpreters, too. Yes. We are very fortunate to have, um, be able to hire bilingual interpreters to work with students, particularly in science and math classes. And they do an amazing job of not only translating, but bridging kind of the cultural gap that some students feel. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So. That's important to do that. <laughs> right. that. They're on the grounds working individually with some of the students who have just recently arrived, yeah. um, not just to Amherst, but to our country. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know not all districts are able to do that, so I'm really fortunate. Or mm -hmm. I feel really fortunate that Amherst is able to do that. We visited other schools where they mm -hmm. say, "Oh, we don't have interpreters," mm -hmm. and I think, "Wow, how <laughs> how do students manage <laughs> in a high manage? school science class?" Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> um, we just have a minute or two left, but is there anything else you'd like to share before we have to wrap the program? Um, I was thinking about um, what you said earlier about the administrators having the um, experience of, of being, you know, in a situation where they don't, uh, where they didn't understand. And I'm thinking if there's any high school students watching this or any students <laughs> watching this, <laughs> you know, to, to like try to imagine what it's like for the ELL students in the district and, um, you know, try just be friendly and try to connect with them. I mean, they make great connections in, you know, within the ELL community, but for kids that don't do sports, for example, it's sometimes hard to feel connected to the wider community. Um, so, um, that's, that's something I just thought I'd yeah. throw in, yeah. And I just want to connect back to the idea about bilingualism being a gift, I yeah. think. Um, we mention it to parents whenever we have a parent conference or a, a parent meeting that, um, we thank them for speaking another language at home with their children because sometimes they worry yeah. that um, speaking a different language has hurt their child. Mm -hmm. And um, I just really want to stress to English-speaking parents as well as uh, parents mm -hmm. who speak a second language that it's, it's great. Please keep speaking another language at home with your child. Yeah. Well, thank you both for all the critical work you do and both acclimating students to the Amherst Public Schools and then working with them to promote their their literacy and fluency, um, both in the academic sphere, but I know there's a lot of what you do that's, that's also beyond just the academics. So 
we're deeply fortunate to have both of you on the staff, so thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for tuning in to the latest episode into Window into ARPS. We'll be back soon with another episode, and thanks for viewing.